morning, everyone. Uh, as Sanjeeva said, uh, my name is Thomas Quayle. I'm the Senior Vice President of Enterprise Architecture and Digital Transformation at West Corporation. West Corporation is a $2.5 billion company that's focused primarily in the telecommunications space globally. Uh, we, have about f we have five segments of our business and four are street reported. Uh, unified communications, safety services, interactive services, which primarily is a notification and uh, a two-way notification business focused on education, healthcare, utility, and commercial. We have a, uh, um, a special agent services business and a, tele and, a, and a traditional telco business. So as we kind of go through, where should I be pointing this thing? We're going to find out together. There we go. OK, so uh, as Sanjeeva did, uh, he went through a definition, uh, kind of going through what digital transformation is. And what I, what I think it's uh, important to think about is that how many of the folks in this room identify themselves as not as an enterprise, more as a early stage company? All right, so about 30% uh, of the group. So when we talk about uh, uh, digital transformation, uh, you, you heard the example about water, where they had the, the, the organizations that are digital native, they grew up cloud ready, they went through this process, they didn't have, they were not impacted by all the elements that kind of came through this. The way I actually define uh, digital transformation for our organization is that it's the fundamental transformation of our business operations, models, and customer experiences, basically optimizing for that new reality around how employees interact, how customers interact, all of those elements that Sanjeeva had talked about. But overall, you start to see that there's these elements that we, ca we have to have. First of all, you have to have a, a mission, vision, and strategy. Ultimately, no project wants to start with the tech. If ultimately you start with the tech, you're pretty much going to be uh, hemmed in from the outset. But what I'd, I'd like to point out is that if you empower employees, they will ultimately engage your customers. The engagement of the customers ultimately ends up in transformation of those products, and then ultimately optimizing those operations. These are not linear uh, in nature. They, you could attack everyone, but I'm, I, I personally believe that everything starts with your staff, it starts with your employees, the digital relevance of those teams, not only from a professional development standpoint, but how you invest, how you empower them to be able to make changes. So when we start to look at transformation as, a, uh, as kind of an organizational context and how, what, what's happening is that we know that change is constant and we know that the rate of change is always increasing. Going through this, we have our uh, kind of a stack model that I, I, I kind of use for this. And when we use this stack model, what ends up happening is you have a foundation of enterprise IT practices. The reason why I asked the question about the, uh, how many enterprises, how many early stage companies are in the room is because whether you're an established firm or you're a company that's you know, in the early stages without a lot of legacy technical debt, you ultimately have to be able to build and deliver your software. So the foundational enterprise IT practices are software development, implementation, operation, so on and so forth. So as we start to move up the organizational uh, chain as it relates to an, uh, a digital transformation, you start to see things like agile adoption, especially in large enterprises with an established installed base, lots of success under their belts. It's not always easy to get people to go and say, hey, you know what? Agile's the first thing I'm gonna do. They go and they look at things as like, you know, we, we operate in all layers of the stack, layer one through seven. So when I typically interact with my uh, leadership teams that are uh, focused on layers one, two, and three, they have a very m waterfall mindset. So you have to work with them in ways to be able to get them to understand that the transformation is going to be valuable. One of the first things that we usually end up doing to get those teams to kind of think in a more agile context is put in periodic retrospectives. What's working, what's not working, those kind of things. So as we move up from the agile uh, adoption, you ultimately start to see the DevOps culture start to co come to the fore. This is not just continuous integration and deployment. Those are tools, those are mechanics. When you think about the uh, DevOps as a culture, it's truly where you have an engineering and operations team that interact and have the same value set, the common, sing the common metrics that are very important to them. That's how they're communicating. It's typically gotta be empowered by an executive team, but ultimately what we see is that that bottom up uh, reality of how small teams evolve. So most small teams evolve very DevOps oriented. Most large teams start to come in a much more teased apart manner. And what we start to see when we see, see this uh, DevOps culture adoption, 
we start to see a, an opportunity for uh, shared accountability. Uh, Lou Cerny from New Relic has a, has a statement, he calls it a, uh, digital is a team sport. And that means that you have product managers, you've got uh, engineering leads, tech leads, operations staff, you've got uh, site reliability engineers, all kinds of folks that are working towards a shared purpose of being able to deliver an application in production and ultimately get customer value. What's the concept of cash? DevOps closes that process out faster. And lastly, I like to talk about the lean enterprise. Lean enterprise is a construct that you can use for being able to transform your business. Transformation of business is nearly constant. Within our organization, our product is a digital asset. So in many other organizations, like we heard about GE with their Predix and their industrial internet, they're ultimately talking about how do they be able to deal with uh, large capital expenses, locomotive engines, uh, aircraft engines, things of that nature. You look at other companies that are, are being able to deliver value in new ways. We talk about Uber. Uber is kind of the ultimate example about entering almost any market and being able to disrupt from within. But this gives you a practice of being able to be a, a, a disciplined approach to uh, uh, managing your project and portfolio management. So it's ultimately that culture is much more difficult than the technology. And it comes down to the reality that uh, it's a human enterprise. People do what's easy. People will ultimately kind of revert back to their, what, what is best for them. Small organizations typically are uh, human-driven, meaning not process-driven. So when things go wrong, they revert back to their relationships, and they go away very quickly from process discipline. So the being able to kind of endorse and force and ultimately have people see that the process is what needs to happen. Our organization operates in uh, 24, 22 countries, 154 locations. Our product development happens all over the world. And when, that, when you start to see the locus of control move between single co-located teams to distributed teams across multiple geographies, continents, cities, so on and so forth, the reality is that they have to work in a process-driven approach. But if that process-driven approach is not built around kind of human reality, people, are, people will make up stories when they don't have enough information. People will insert the boogeyman. They'll go and say, oh, they're doing this for this reason. You know, conspiracy theories abound in enterprises. So as we start to look at uh, what initiatives get pulled into these kind of uh, uh, stages of, of development, and ultimately these are not necessarily that uh, they, they, they build upon each other, but they're, again, not linear, okay? So if you look at the, the IT practices, those practices that have, uh, are able to deliver value to the organization, when we think about what initiatives have to be underway to be able to transform the business, the first one I always come back to is the inventory. What products do you have? What, uh, what, what systems support those? What platforms support those? What licensing arrangement? What vendor relationships do you have? What are the, ultimately the business capabilities? From an enterprise architecture, we uh, talk about capability modeling all the time. What is the business capability? What are we mapping into it from a systems perspective? But knowing what you have gives you the opportunity to kind of look at, hey, is this the right technology for what we need to do? Is this gonna move the business forward? Is this relevant to where the market is headed? I mean, we've seen the, uh, the, the buzzword bingo move from service orientation to enterprise service buses to middlewares to EAI layers. Uh, just kind of moving through the evolution of how marketing uh, kind of drives some of this. So the analyst community kind of looks at something, but it's not uncommon for the analyst community to seed a term, and then all of a sudden it's like the new term. And you, if you're not talking it in the context of that, you're ultimately missing out. I have digital transformation in my title. I mean, like, I look at it and I'm like, I just think of that as just like being a ch uh, change agency. So when you also now look at the, the, the next layers over, you have to implement and refine your processes. And so you look at things like ITSM, you look at your project and portfolio management. These are very basic things. You're able to go to ITIL and be able to get certified in foundations courses. You're able to understand what these things are. Those don't go away in an enterprise context. They don't go away in a, in a transformed organization either. And it's important to note that when you do go forward with this transformation activity, if you're, if you're not delivering strategically or tactically, there is no transformation conversation, okay? So if email is not up and running, you can't talk about strat strategic technology. If you're, it, it just the basis of your credibility is based on this foundation layer. 
So ultimately, you want to be able to do is collapse and consolidate. You need to reduce the amount of technical debt. Everybody here talks about it. Like there's this notion of brownfield versus greenfield, and there's this kind of, uh, you know, just put this new thing in place, and it'll make, it, uh, make everything uh, uh, easier. How many folks here have worked in an operations capacity uh, previously? Okay. All right. Some of you. Uh, well, there, in the operations, there's this problem we call the N plus 1 problem. N plus 1 means that you have... 10 systems, and there's something new. And somebody goes and says, well, of course we need to have that. And we don't go and go subtract one system off the plate and put another one on. It's always n plus 1. Now you have 11. Now you have 12, so on and so forth. The opportunity to rationalize and consolidate your portfolio has to happen in a disciplined manner. It is not something that a general manager or a line of business that has a quarter by quarter P&L is going to come to you and go, yes, I think it's great to get rid of that revenue generating product over here. Okay, but ultimately, when you're looking out you know, three, five, ten years into the, into the future, you have to understand that basically the innovator's dilemma, Clay Christensen, that kind of view of looking at what's holding your portfolio back might be the thing that's generating revenue for you uh, today. And lastly, you're going to see a theme here, managing and communicating metrics. So if you start to see the traditional IT metrics, efficiency, cost, net promoter scores, being able to kind of work through this uh, you know, ability to articulate business value in the context of what's being delivered in IT. If you're not able to partner with the business, ultimately you're in a situation where they're going to look at you as a cost center. And what we want to be able to do and what we have as a mandate to do, the, I, the CIO's office is now a strategic partner. It's, a, it, it's got a seat at the table. It's had a seat at the table probably since about 2008 or 9. But now what we're seeing is that this emergence of a chief digital officer, chief information officer, I think is ultimately a, uh, a breakdown where the CIO didn't have an opportunity necessarily to participate in that, that discussion. So as we start to look into things like the agile adoption, you have the training that's necessary. How do you actually get the teams to go from point A to point B? How do you get them to work in an iterative fashion? How do you th get them to look at things like release management and not in the context of once a year or twice a year? How do you actually get them into a context where they're able to deliver? This could be done through training. This could be done through something like this. But ultimately, the foundation layer is IT practices. The agile layer is around uh, uh, product development and delivery or product development and ultimately the, the iterations associated with that. And then we start to look at some of the techniques. You got uh, Scrum, ALM, Application Lifecycle Management, XP, user-centered design. So we start to hear about these terms that kind of creep into that customer-obsessed, that customer-centric approach. When we look at you know, an engaged employee base is ultimately empowered to change the products. They're then able to look at the business processes that are necessary to be able to to be refactored, and looking at completely refining their operations as well. I, I think that this uh, notion of you know, uh, maturity modeling, looking at team dynamics, understanding where your teams are at any given point is always an opportunity for you to be able to kind of let them decide what's important. What, you know, in some cases, you know, being completely automated is a, is a desire. They'd love to have that, but that's not necessarily an option. Test-driven design, that's something they might want to bring into their, their mix. They don't necessarily want to uh, have that foisted on them by a, by a leadership team. But when you start to see the metrics that come out of this, Agile, in, in, in my view, is a mirror. It gives you a, a, an opportunity to really see what the teams are actually doing. Waterfall tamps that down. It ultimately gives you kind of an opportunity to have air cover around, hey, I've got this big process, it's specs, it's this, this long-running thing. But most executive teams don't like what they first see when they start to see Agile projects because what they start to see is actual velocity. It's starting to see the sausage making happen, and it's no longer a concept. It's something they can actually, uh, they have to be accountable for. I talk a little about this, uh, this notion of R. So this is uh, Steve Blank's R metrics. Uh, the pirate in all of us loves to just say that. So uh, that stands for uh, awareness, acquisition, activation, revenue, retention, and then referral. If you're starting to think about a customer-centric organization, you need to bake these, these kind of contexts. How do people get access to the information about your products? How do they activate it? Ultimately, how do they, does that convert to revenue? And, and, 
and then re uh, retention and then referral. And if you think about as this kind of flows through, these are, this is a meta layer that sits above all products. And this definitely sits inside a B2B context because nothing is better than word of mouth. You're able to actually go and say, you know, there's, there's the easiest way for me to get people to be interested in a product uh, or a solution or a technology set or something like that is to be able to show it to them, be able to get them give the tools to be able to get that access to that, the, those, uh, those data. As we start to move up into the DevOps culture, the tool sets that are available to them. So you start to hear about, you know, obviously CI, CD. The, the, this very gets into the collaboration aspects. Obviously, you see collaboration kind of come in lower. But when you think about the traditional co uh, context around Agile, you think about it in the context of co-located, or most folks take it into uh, co-located teams. You have application performance management, that digital as a, as a team sport, kind of how you're going to deal with those. Shared repositories for code. You start to talk about things like our API, our API marketplaces, API gateways. Ultimately, the things that we're hearing about in the context of this conference are enabling engines for this, for this digital transformation. It starts locally with teams being able to understand, hey, you know what, team A and team B, they're, they're working on something, whether it's a microservice oriented or an API driven, you know, all the way back through, through all of the traditional layers and geologies of, of how technology is being built. But what we start to see is that shared repositories, CI, CD pipelines, being able to have the visibility and all of the metrics and data that kind of come out of that as exhaust are key. When we start to look at release management and the metrics associated with that, you could actually see real time whether or not your teams are improving the code or degrading the code. Ultimately, whether or not that's giving more customer value, you're able to see those hits come and so on and so forth. But I kind of look at it like this. If you think about enterprise IT practices and that traditional almost okay to be waterfall uh, approach, and then you start to move up in agile, you really can't be a DevOps team until you could trace a, re a functional requirement from development into production and then back that out without fixing forward. So fixing forward is that everybody here has been the, to the release party, right? You know? So not exactly a party you want to go to, but they're, they're there. Okay, but you know what happens when you start to get to a CI CD culture and, and, and agile, you start to see the Tuesday afternoon release and then the soak in phase where you're able to see AB testing, blue and gold testing, things like champion and challenger start to kind of get into the mix. This is what DevOps starts to bring to the table. And ultimately, as we see the modernization of technology stacks, managed paths, uh, you know, these, these start to deliver that value. When we start to look at some of the maturity modeling that happens around this, you see architectural modeling, you see uh, data management practices, environment and, and, and uh, uh, deployment practices, configuration management. These are starting to become shared skills throughout an enterprise. We have about 1,100 people in our shared services organization. We have about 2,600 people in our, in our product development organizations across our company. Those 3,700, yeah, the 3,700 people combined make up our entire product delivery stack. The last tier of that which we are part of is that lean enterprise. So ultimately we as leadership teams, when you look at from management directors, you know, all the cruft and layers of vice presidents inside an organization of our size, you ultimately start to see an organization that has to be able to operate at where it's comfortable. What's the language? What is the kind of the business process that they need to be able to do? So I'm going to talk a little bit to you today about the three horizon model, uh, a mechanism for doing portfolio management that gives you the ability to disrupt from within. That's kind of the basis of this presentation. You have the opportunity to do segmentation around business and operational model. So when we talk about digital transformation, we're really talking about operational transformation. We're talking about product introduction to the market. You're talking about all of these elements that ultimately end up being part of your, your, kind of, your, your generalized context of how the company identifies itself. So what you start to see now is that this uh, notion of it endorsed experimentation occurs. So we talk about you know, uh, using the, 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 the newly released WSO2 clouds and being able to experiment in those, those environments. What happens inside a team, I've seen it uh, being called things like uh, leap sprints in, in case of some uh, higher functioning agile teams, but I've also seen it where you go and say, I'm going to spin off a Skunk Works team to go do more experimentation. But for every thousand experiments, if you're lucky, if 10 hit. Okay? So you need to be able to get as many experiments into the mix as possible. When I talk about experimentation, I'm talking about allowing the teams to solve problems that aren't necessarily being uh, you know, dropped in front of them by the marketing organization. 
So we start to look at things like uh, the metrics that come out of that, new product introduction, new, new sources of customer value, and ultimately how you're performing on, on something called the lean value tree. And you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about that in the, in the uh, lean enterprise context. And really that's kind of that traceability between your mission, vision, goals, objectives, you know, your, your uh, bets, in, case, in this case, what are your, your strategic objectives and what are those promises of value? How is the customer going to get, or how is the business going to derive any business value out of that? And then ultimately, pods, your agile teams, how they're deployed to be able to deliver on that. So we start to see, and this is kind of a Gartner term, mode one, mode two. Mode one parts of the organization typically operate layers, you know, one, zero, one two, three, and four you know, kind of low-level networking, kind of telephony, how you're going to deal with the kind of the, the, those aspects. And then layers five, six, seven are those businesses that don't care. And we almost call this the value line. In our case, we are a telco, so we have to care below the value line. But when you're a cloud-first, you know, digital native business, you have an account with Amazon or Azure or GCP or, you know, pick your favorite cloud provider of the day, and you don't worry about that. They're delivering you some x86 uh, footprint, and then you're ultimately able to consume those. You're able to have a business relationship with them, whether on-prem or in the cloud. Uh, that, that's part of your reality. As we start to move up and we look in this mode two, this multi-speed IT delivery, they need to coexist. You need to be able to tool your organizations in the context of being able to, to deliver uh, side by side. When you're putting your initiatives forward, whether you're a, you know, an engineer de developing an API or you're a leader having to bring forward a bigger idea, it's a very important that digital has a tendency to be, digital transformation has a tendency to be very touchy-feely. People look at it and go and say, oh, well, you know what? That'd be great, but I got 10 other things that are more important that I have very real value. I've found that if you put things in the context of uh, you know, financial metrics, return on investment, internal rate of return, things that are important to your financial officer, you ultimately have more credibility. The lingua franca of business is money. Ultimately, if you can uh, talk about things in the context of earnings per share, value to the business, things like that, your ideas go through, okay? The days of technology, so we heard about, it, okay? If technology is in all companies, the business of technology is now the business of all companies. And what we need to be able to do as technologists is be more facile in being able to speak to business people in the context and terms that they are. No longer are the days that you're going to be able to go and say, hey, you know what? I just live in the basement. I do my work. The Morlocks are down here. The Eloy are up there. And they're going to kind of work out it's a, uh, you know, the H.G. Wells reference. Anyway, um, but anyway, the thing is, is that what ends up happening is you have to be able to interact with these people. You can't not uh, engage with your business counterparts. Ultimately, your credibility depends on it. So a little bit about a cookbook. I'm going to give you kind of like, what are the steps that I've seen organizations go through? And uh, how do you actually end up delivering on them? And this is a tale of three organizations. I'm going to give you West, our own. Uh, and it's a journey, not a destination. So this process is never done. Uh, the thing about change management is it's kind of like pushing a rock up a hill, and then it rolls down the hill, and then you push it back up the hill, and hopefully it stays there after a while. Okay. But the thing is, is that one organization I'm going to give you is West. The other one I'm going to give you is the, the British government, the digital uh, government dot, uh, organization, their EA practice. And then the last one I'm going to give you is a large uh, pharmaceutical company. So in the case of ours, the first thing we did is we, uh, we adopted uh, Lean Enterprise. You know, you could, you could take other techniques. This is just the one that we decided on. Uh, it's, it's a derivative of kind of lean manufacturing. You might have heard of it called Lean Startup, so the Eric Reese books. Uh, O'Reilly's got a whole series that they'll pimp out to you. They'll, they'll sell it to you with, with great abandon. You can have peak speakers come to talk to you and those kind of things. But it's important to note that one of the reasons that we selected it was because uh, other organizations like GE had built their practices around it, and they were able to evolve from a traditional pimbock oriented portfolio management, the project management book of knowledge, kind of those, th those approaches, and be able to then incorporate uh, this, this kind of lean uh, learning cycle. So this is where we actually introduced our goals, bets, promises, and pods. How do we deploy across the organization? But it's important to note, we took what they call an exemplar model. The exemplar model was where I go ahead and I go and I look for a team that's high functioning, and then I look for a team that's not high functioning, and then I look for a team that's kind of in the middle. Okay? And what we did is by basing, uh, going in any one of those teams and being able to, to test our concepts, whether that be 
uh, the introduction of Agile, the introduction of DevOps, being able to look at, at uh, shorter release cycles, all those aspects, everything that we did was we built a maturity model. That maturity model only ultimately ends up being the value that we're able to go to a team and say, hey team, use this as a, ba a, a tool to baseline yourselves be able to determine what the values are. So this is in addition to uh, you know, how you're delivering your functional scope, but ultimately giving you the ability, them, the ability to identify where they want to get better as, uh, from a practice perspective. And what's important about that practice perspective is that we heard about it earlier when, when Sanjeeva said, you know, if your employees aren't getting the, the nutrition that they want, they'll go elsewhere. Okay, so if you're able to work in a high, a high functioning team, you're able to work with new, uh, the modern forward looking tools and techniques, you're able to integrate a hybrid cloud environment, you know, public and private IaaS environments, things of that nature, uh, in a way that is where, the, where business value is actually gonna be uh, derived, that ultimately ends up being how you retain employees, okay? So we wanted to ultimately look at this and we, we, work, we work with those teams, we went, did that exemplar model, refined our models from there, and then we created a playbook. That playbook then gets uh, delivered to all of the heads of product development across the company. Uh, we go out and we do road shows, we do training, we do all those kind of things. Um, I have a tendency to get the blather on for days at a time. So we then look at like, how do we improve and align this on a, uh, a predictab predictable cad cadence? Not only in the strategic planning cycles of the kind of the, the macro environment of, of how business finance works, but also working with teams in a, in a, in a semi-annual basis, looking at how you deal with this quarterly, that then flows right into how teams deal with their release management, and then ultimately their sprint management, and then all the way down into their, to their, uh, their sco uh, story delivery. So looking at this, uh, the, again, that exemplar model, we then have the ability to go and say, hey, you know what, we could move people between parts of the organization and get them the ability to say, this worked, this didn't work. And so you wanna be able to remove barriers to uh, uh, putting in best in class solutions. It's not uncommon in a, in a mode one organization that's got a legacy in investment, especially a significant amount of data centers, to have a significant amount of you know, political capital baked into that. You have to understand that this is not necessarily a, a, a bad thing, but the thing that you have to be able to do is get them a path so they can actually be part of this journey as well. It can't be that there's this mode one part of the organization that loses and then there's all the cool kids over here that get to go play in mode two. That can't be how it is because ultimately people will resist anything that marginalizes what their contribution actually ends up being, okay? The next thing is, is that you need to look at the business processes. How many times have you been told that's just the way it is? That's, this is the way it is, that's the way it's been, that we do this because this is some folklore about the organization, they've built this process. You need to be able to have the mandate and ultimately the, the wherewithal to be able to go and say, if we do it this way, we get this result. If we do it this way, you know, you get that result. And then this could be your experiment. So that experimentation is also your opportunity to re-engineer uh, uh, business processes. And lastly, you need to limit the scope so you're able to build on shared wins. Nothing is, you know, boiling the ocean, building these multi-year projects, you know, these kind of things. Ultimately, no project should have a birth date. If it does, you should probably look at how you're actually delivering business value because we wanna be able to scope that down in such a way that you're able to deliver in a way that people can actually uh, touch and feel it. Most of the folks that get brought in in a digital transformation or change management context are coming in from the outside. They have 90 days to make an impact or they're gone. They have 180 days to kind of iterate over that. So you kind of look at this, it's like kind of like a, a political campaign. It ultimately adds up, you know, you, you campaign for your case, now you gotta deliver, okay? so. We start to look at the way uh, uh, this was done in the British government. This is, this is the, you know, if you go to uh, uh, their transformation uh, engine, and it's pretty impressive. Uh, they established clear principles of mission focused on the customer. Uh, they fostered a cu uh, culture of continuous improvement. They created a foundation of technical excellence. They formed the right cross-functional team. They changed the business processes before the changing of technology. And they limited initial scope and delivered value early and often. Seems similar, right? So this is kind of a, I kind of look at it as the cookbook, the recipes, all the other stuff. So now if we look at the uh, pharmaceutical com company, uh, early alignment and an elevated mission and purpose, they were kind of looking at that one metric to, to, to deliver the most value. Uh, delivered a passion, uh, develop passionate and engaged leadership. No, this is not for the weak at heart, okay? If you don't like disappointment, 
Digital transformation is probably not your thing in, in, in an enterprise. This is something that requires every day you've got to get up and walk in and be like, you know what? Three people are going to tell me no, but one person is going to tell, me, tell you yes. And the thing that's what, what's really important about that is if you go where you're invited, you could build the successes with people that are willing. Don't try to change your worst uh, you know, detractor first. But, then, but definitely include them in kind of that transformation story because they'll hear about it. They'll hear about these successes. And as long as it's not always coming from you, it's going to be coming from parts of the organization that are actually seeing the value. Establish a true north metric aligned on business outcomes over transformation outcomes. Nobody cares about what you've transformed. They care about the money that you make the business, how much more efficient you make the business, how you're delivering new products, new features, new functionality, things that are valuable to your customer. Ultimately, how do you, how do you protect the brand? Because if you're going into a digital transformation and it's a marketing-related activity, typically it's like, let's do a new logo. Let's talk about the brand hierarchy. Let's do all these kind of things like that. The reason why we, uh, we, we've taken two, a two-fold approach. One is to deal with the marketing side, and then the other was to deal with the technology side. And the technology side was really uh, driven out of the enterprise architecture practice. And the enterprise architecture practice was because that was a key lever for us to be able to move things through. Next area is, is like looking at your, uh, your transitional lean promotion office or team. Uh, we really didn't do that in our organization. We actually uh, embedded it in the EA practice. We are under two years. We're actually in the, uh, just coming up over our first year uh, of this process. So it's, uh, it's definitely a long process. And then we want to be able to... Uh, uh, leverage lean evangelists to guide change. When you start to see those successes inside the organization, make sure those people are getting, uh, getting a good victory lap alongside you. Sanjeeva said this earlier. I think it's important. Accept that your ideas probably are not very good. Okay? You have to be able to test your ideas, iterate over them, understand that almost everything. So I was in the military for many years. I uh, was a navigator on a ship. And uh, I thought it was interesting and uh, a, a comment that I had heard recently that was very accurate. Uh, when you're traveling between point A and point B, you're off course 98% of the time. If you're not constantly correcting for what you're actually looking to do as your goal or, or your destination, you need to understand that you're, you're probably not on track most of the time. But you need to be able to have an ongoing dialogue about what is and isn't working to be able to make that happen. Empower your people to make decisions. You spend a lot of money on your staff, these people are smart, they know what they're doing. Give them the latitude to be able to make decisions. In my, in my role, I look at how far down can we drive decision making. We don't want decision making always to be at the, you know, a C-suite executive or some executive or something like that. We want it to be at a tech lead level. We work with tech leads and architects, so uh, people typically go, oh, are you gonna put an architect on my project? And I'm like, really? Do you want an architect on your project? What I think that you'd probably want is you want a tech lead that's local to the problem, solving the problem, able to make decisions about their product, and ultimately looking at an architect to help them develop out the guardrails and swim lanes around that. You want to measure smart, your outcomes, not your outputs, because things like efficiency metrics ultimately are that lower level, that base level of IT uh, practice. This, this is product exhaust. Your systems will be able to produce this. What's the velocity of moving stories through a Kanban board or, or a JIRA uh, or the like? Uh, you ultimately have that. Um, and then you also want to seek f fast and frequent feedback on everything that you do. Even if you just end every meeting was, hey, was that valuable? Was this a good use of your time? Because if you start to do that with every meeting, people start to get away from the idea that, like, you know, the, the, the crickets problem, you know, silence is acceptance. Silence is not acceptance. That just means that they're going to go have another meeting in the hall and then talk about what they didn't talk about in, in the room. You really, so we've done a thing in our organization where we, uh, where we shut down every one-hour meeting at the 45 mark. And the reason why is because then we just basically let it kind of open up for, for discussion. Or at least I do that in my own schedule. So Harvard Business Review a few years ago uh, uh, published uh, an author named uh, James Cotter. Uh, and he has this kind of eight-step process for leading change. This is something that has been since the 90s, and ultimately, I think it's really important. You've got to create a sense of urgency. You've got to build a guiding coalition. If people are not willing, if you don't have strong leadership at the top that is invested in the idea of transformation, guess what? It's going to be real tough. It's going to be an uphill battle because you're going to be going and saying, hey, you know, 
we think we need to transform, and the leadership team's like, no, we don't. You, know? you want them to be able to have that sense of urgency right alongside you. There needs to be a vision for these initiatives. They need to be strategically focused. You want to enlist the, uh, volunteers. You know people that want to change inside your organization. There's, there's, everybody knows those folks that are like, you know, chomping at the bit to be a part of this. And then what ends up happening is you need to move those barriers out of their way. You need to be able to enable those short-term wins. And then ultimately you need to sustain that acceleration and institute that change. This is nearly identical to these. So if you start to see kind of like, obviously he's much more well known, you know, he's the Harvard, uh, Harvard professor and he's done this with, you know, many different companies. But ultimately what we see is that this process ends up being a key part of the way we actually have to manage change management across the organization. All right, so disruption. You have a choice. It could either be you disrupt yourself or guess what? Somebody's gonna come for your lunch. If you're not digital, if you're not transforming, you're slowly going out of business, okay? Rather you're a physical goods company, a manufacturing company, uh, or a digital company. We're a digital native company. We have to transform because we know that other players are coming into the market. You do not wanna be the best DVD distribution firm when they're going to streaming. Okay, and that's what the reality is. The Kodak example is one of those classic ones about, you know, they, really, they were the inventors of digital photography, but they never actually brought it to market. But ultimately, what we want to see is that there are a new generation of disruptors. And typically, these 40 companies right here are all worth more than a billion dollars. If we start to look to the right here, you start to see them get to two to five billion, five to 40 billion, and 40 billion dollars plus. Everybody's favorite example is Uber. This is from 2015, okay? But the thing that it's, it's meant to illustrate that many of these companies you might have or might not have heard of uh, in the context of your own business, okay? So what ends up happening in this context is we start to talk about this thing called the, uh, uh, the Three Horizons model. So this is actually from the, uh, the, the book Lean Enterprise uh, from... Uh, uh, Jez Humble, Janet Molesky, and Barry O'Reilly. And we start to see this notion of horizon one. Horizon one is this execute, sustain, and, and retire. The traditional, what's making me money today? What are the, what are the applications that we need to be able to deliver on? And you're, you're selling those to your core market. So whether in our case, we go and we say, all right, let's look at our safety business. Our safety business is primarily uh, works with, uh, you know, the big uh, carriers, AT&T, Verizon, so on and so forth. And then we have another part of our business that sells into municipalities, okay? What happens in that context is that if they define themselves in a Horizon 1 context, they're gonna run out of market opportunity sooner or later. There's only so many of them. But an example of a Horizon 2 is when we combine two aspects of our business. Kind of the, the, the definition of, in, one of the definitions of innovation is the intersection of two industries to create a new solution. So Horizon 2 would be like combining our safety business with our school notification business. And now we have a solution that we could offer to uh, our uh, uh, higher ed uh, customers because they're more, typically they're not notifying anybody unless it's a, a safety need. So it's important that the seeds of today our seeds of today are planted to be able to ultimately harvest for tomorrow. And that means that you're looking at your PL in a much longer time horizon than quarter by quarter. Horizon two, demonstrate, exploit, and scale. What are those adjacent market opportunities you want to go after? Ultimately, to be able to you know, disrupt yourself. How do you bring new market opportunities in? The idea is that your business is going to ultimately you know, harvest these things into new market opportunities. They can coexist side by side. You could think of them as new product introduction. You could think of them in the context of the S-curve and in the context of product delivery. But ultimately, the last one is that, what are those uh, horizon three? What are those disruptive moonshots, those things that you need to actually invest? What are one of those thousand experiments that you actually uh, uh, wanna, wanna test out? I'm gonna give a quick example of that. So Sanjeeva talked a little bit about IVR. We are the IVR company. We actually create that software. Quite a bit of our customers, whether it be commercial, utility, healthcare, or education, use our software in that context, both inbound and outbound. But a Horizon 3 item, which would be interesting from my view, is, okay, we get a lot of people that are talking to us, and they're talking to us via uh, you know, our IVR. We, usually they're mad at somebody, and they're talking to the, to, the, to the tree and so on. But what we've found is that in some cases, uh, voice recognition can now be used to treat medical conditions. You know, for example, PTSD. 
but you wouldn't think about that in the context of our existing business. So you'd say, oh, well, you're an IVR company and you're doing a lot of natural language processing. Well, an opportunity for us is that we could use that same technology to be able to deliver you know, value for, uh, for medical professionals, specifically in the diagnosis of hard to treat conditions that people are typically embarrassed about, in this case, uh, PTSD. Is that gonna pay off? I don't know. But is that something that you'd wanna check out or try? Yeah, that might be something pretty cool. My only reason for bringing that example up is that is an example of something that is not core to our business today, not adjacent to any of the market opportunities we have today, but could be something that's incredibly disruptive, not only for our organization, but other organizations as well. So, you wanna provoke this kind of change through enterprise architecture and continuous delivery. Whether it be software in use, software solution delivery over top of that, business process improvement, ultimately looking up at how does your enterprise ultimately kind of rationalize its portfolio, and then how does it participate in the industry. When we look at each one of these layers, you start to see techniques that ultimately kind of come out of that. So, you know, you want to assess the effectiveness of design decisions. You want to make sure that your features that you're putting into the code base are actually being used by the customer. Well, that's application performance management. If you want to ensure software uh, achieves attended, uh, uh, intended goals, you're going to look at uh, what's, your what's the profitability of the application. What, what is the use of that application? In, in some cases, we have many businesses in our area that don't care about profitability. They care about the use and consumption of the applications because those metrics actually provide their valuation. And, uh, and, I make, and I've been in startups, so I make no judgment about that at all. Uh, you want to maintain alignment to the broader long-term needs. Is the application developing? I kind of look at it as agile projects are really good at cutting down trees, but they're not very good at telling you if you're in the wrong forest. You need to have strategy that overlays that. You need to have architecture that overlays that. Ultimately, helping those teams make those decisions. As we start to move up the chain, you're able to look at performance and improvement, making work easier to do, reduction of cost of service, improved software quality, and service quality. That quality of service metrics, in many of our cases, is the difference between retaining a customer or losing one. And if you want to look at the techniques or the tools that ultimately get made up as a part of this, you think of things like performance dashboards, that APM dashboard, the application lifecycle management, how are things flowing through those systems. You start to see things like pattern libraries, shared code repositories, uh, process level integration. Everything you're going to hear about at this conference is ultimately going to be around the enablement of these type of architectural components within your business to be able to deliver value, to ultimately make it your product development teams faster to get their, their ideas to market. That concept to cash pipeline, if you're able to shrink that down, you're ultimately able to give your, uh, uh, your businesses a lot more agility. As we start to come into close, I just wanted to offer a couple of uh, uh, resources that I think are important. So the three books that I kind of cited uh, in this are, uh, are the Lean Enterprise book from, uh, from O'Reilly, the leading, leading digital book by uh, uh, the folks uh, from, I believe they're from PwC. Um, they might be from Deloitte, I'm not 100% sure. But ultimately, a uh, very good book about understanding kind of what is the, the parameters of these. And whether you're a line level engineer, or you're a leader in the technology organization, or you're a leader of a company, what needs to happen is you need to understand that you're, what you're doing fits into a larger puzzle. puzzle. And last is that John Cotter book that, that I mentioned earlier. From uh, online resources, I'm a big fan of uh, these, um, the, the blogs at Microsoft around transformation. Whether you're a fan of Microsoft or not, they've got their head on straight as far as how do they work inside an enterprise. Once, one of the things that's very important is that they have, they have lived in the enterprise longer than most enterprises have been alive. So they kind of define that, that market space. Uh, the, trans, uh, the Our Thinking from uh, uh, PwC, digital.pwc.com. Uh, uh, very good, they, are, they have this thing called the digital quotient, they, are, they, they give you the ability to measure yourself. And then the last one is the ThoughtWorks Insight. Uh, you know, we, we have a lot of uh, uh, work that we do with that organization, so um, I find myself uh, referring back to those materials on a, on a pretty regular, regular basis. So, that concludes my presentation, but I wanted to just kinda uh, close with a couple of thoughts. Uh, if you kind of look at this in, the, in, in, in transformation, it's important to think about it as a journey. You can't go into this thinking like, I'm, I've transformed. 
you know, because what happens is right on the heels of that, you're ultimately going to have to uh, uh, transform another area of your organization. The, the, that stackable pyramid with all the initiatives on it, each one of those is, a, is an area that is, is a discipline in which you could actually transform. I think it's important to note that when you're in this context, whether you're in a, a business with a significant installed base, legacy organization, in our case, two plus billion dollars a year, you know, some of our applications are 30 years old, some of them have just been released. You kind of look at this and this is what I call a target rich environment. Pick your targets based on where you can deliver value. If you're gonna think about where you're gonna focus your energy, typically focus on those applications that have been built in the last seven years. You don't wanna be able to work with something that can't be virtualized, can't do those kind of things. We've seen teams that have modular monoliths that are actually breaking them off as microservices, starting to get advantage of those. But ultimately what you need to be able to do is have something you could point to that an executive or someone that, you, that is going to fund you cares about. If you don't do that, you're going to be constantly trying to justify your value. And what happens is that as people start, we're talking about in the context of transformation, most teams talk about this as the day-to-day -day work of their, what they do. That's every day. Software engineers working in agile teams that are ultimately, <laughs> DevOps is part of their DNA. It's not part of their, their, uh, their uh, it's not a new thing for them. But when you start to think about executives that we're going to have to change the way their dialogue is going on how the portfolio is managed. That has to happen because they understand that technology is now their business and business is now about the technology. With that, I wanted to say thank you. Sanjeeva, thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. And I look forward to seeing you all at the conference. Mm -hmm.